I was born in a Muslim family. It's not only a Muslim family. Actually, they were a strong Muslim family. I remember from the six years old of my childhood, not before that, but from that moment, I remember that my father built a mosque at the other side of the street that we used to live. And I remember the first day that he took me to the mosque and introduced me to the Imam, the leader of the mosque. So I learned how to pray, I learned how to fast, and every step of ritual stuff that we have to do in Islamic faith, I try to learn it daily. And I was so close to the Imam of that mosque that pretty soon they appointed me as the one who was standing next to him when he was doing prayer, uh, what's going to happen the next step, bow down, stand up, and I will announce it through the loudspeaker so the crowd behind him could follow him. And I was reading Quran. I was just uh, reading the other books about Islamic faith, always asking from the Imam, I was very close to him, and I said, you know, I love to be with God forever because I knew there is a death after this temporal life. And I said, would you please let me know how much more should I pray and do fasting or any other thing because I want to know for sure when I die, I want to be with God. And there was no answer for me. He just stopped me. And then I went home and I asked my dad the same answer. I said, oh my God, if the Imam cannot answer me, and if he knew I'm searching the true God, why he is not encouraging me, what should I do? They knew I'd love to follow the religion, but there's no answer for me. I got married and I had a wonderful child. And at the age of 27, I went to Mecca. And I was praying in Mecca. Uh, somebody tapped on my shoulder and said, are you married? I said, why? They said, because your accent, your pronunciation was not 100% right in the holy place of Ibrahim. And I have a recommendation from Allah to you. And I said, what's that? They said, you have to divorce your wife. And I was shocked because I said, I came here to follow God, worship God, and now I have to divorce my wife. And I told them, hey, there is something wrong here. I'm not going to stay anymore. So I left Mecca. And I went back home and knocked the door. My wife said, what are you doing here? I said, you need a religious man or a husband? If you need a religious man, then I have to divorce you. Otherwise, I stop that. But you know, Satan is clever. I got a car accident pretty soon, and my car in the highway flipped over a bridge eight times, and it stopped upside down. And when the people rushed toward that valley, they turned over the car, they broke the back window, they broke the doors, and I was paralyzed. For 14 years, I was suffering. My left leg was paralyzed. Two times surgery on my back. Nobody could do anything. And I was ashamed of my wife because she loved me so much, even my parents told, hey, you can go ahead and live for your for self because he is sick always. But there was no hope. My best friend became surgeon after 14 years. He couldn't do anything. I went to London with my wife and over there I got four different opinions. None of them were the same. I made a decision I'm going to make a suicide. This is horrible life. My relative introduced me to his neighbor and his neighbor you Parents used to be a missionary to the country that I was born. And they came and visited me. They said, we carry to my doctor. And they drove for maybe two hours to a small city from the place that we used to live. And on the way, he asked me, how do you believe in Jesus Christ? And I said, stop. I went to Mecca even over there. I couldn't find anything. Now you are bringing my, me back 600 years, years you know, uh, before that. Stop it. He said, no, just tell me who is Christ for you. And I said, he was a prophet, he came, he died, and God, it means stop. But praise God for him, he said, no, he is the son of God, he died, but he rose again, he's alive. And I said, would you please stop, I don't want to come with you. You make a man God, he said, I don't make a man God, I proclaim God became a man, it's a big difference. And so finally he carried me to the place, and that was not a doctor, that was a church. And that church was showing the play about the life of Christ. And that was a turning point in my life. Because maybe you people that are watching right now knew that in Islam they told you that Christ never died on the cross. So I used to believe that. But here I was seeing that Christ died on the cross for me. And the Lord brought me back to Mecca. Reminds me, you remember over there? They told you, go divorce your wife. And here I am. I left my glory in heaven became flesh, died on the cross for you. My heart was beating so much, I wanted to give my life right now. The resurrection part was a big, big changing point in my heart. 
And the answer to my question, that for, from the childhood, how much should I pray more? How much should I do the best to be with God? And right now was the answer. He gave his life for me. He paid the penalty. At that night I stopped. But a week later, this man didn't stop. He took me to the church. And the moment I went to the worship center, the presence of the Lord just touched me, surrounded me. Because the joy on the face of the people was incredible. Shaking hand to me, welcoming me. And I never forgot any time that I went to mosque. Even the leader of the mosque, I was so respectful to him. He didn't answer me right now. The people who doesn't know me, they're welcoming me deeply. And the lady in front of me asked me, you have an accent, where are you from? And the moment he, she said, you have an accent, I was thinking, oh, another problem. Maybe, uh, I don't know what should I do with my wife this time. So on the way back, I saw a Bible in my own language, and I took it, and I started to read it. And then a week later, the pastor came to our home and started to talk about the Bible. And he started to explain about the Bible, this is the Word of God, and he explained... You know, we all have sin and sure, fall short of the glory of God and we need to repent. And then he explained to me that Christ is the answer to our sin. He died for us on the cross. So if uh, you have any question about the salvation, that's what the basic stuff of that. You have to believe in your heart that Christ died on the cross for you and buried and rose again on the third day. From that moment, all of your sin has been forgiven. And my wife was sitting there and those family, they took me there, they were there. And I said, Pastor, uh, I have a question. And the moment that the, a Muslim guy asked a pastor of a church, I have a question, they thought, oh wow, the big problem, they are going to ask about the Trinity, uh, the Son of God. I said, Pastor, really, I want to tell you and confess that that night, that passion touched my heart because the moment I saw Christ rose again from the dead, and He, before that, died for my sin, that was convinced me totally. I knew that that's the truth. I want to give my life to the Lord right now. And it was amazing that the moment that the pastor started to lead us to a prayer, and I saw my wife crying out, and she did the same thing. And I asked her, why you did that? She said, I had the same feeling that you had at that passion. I didn't want to make another burden for you because you were sick. And now I want to confess the same thing. So that night was the first night after years of suffering of pain. I went to sleep one hour continuously because other nights I had to wake up every other hour, ask for help to change my position. That was the reason it really changed my life. And then we started to read the Bible and all of the answers was right there in the book of Matthew, hey, in the book of John, especially in the book of John. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God. He became flesh and devil among us and I said oh wow that's all the need what I need so we grow up in our faith and two months later I woke up and I had a feeling on my left leg and my wife thought I'm crazy she said don't stand up you will fell down and make broken you know some other part of your body and I said no I have a feeling because she knew they put many needles here as an acupuncture I couldn't feel them right now I touch my leg and I feel it she carried me to the hospital. The doctor, after showed up, examined me, he said, who did that your surgery on your back? I said, are you ready to hear that? You are the greatest doctor in the area, but my case was so worth it. You rejected me, but the greatest and cheapest doctor did that surgery. He said, tell me the name. I said, maybe you don't know him. He said, I'm very familiar. I said, but he is not familiar. And the moment I told him Jesus Christ, he was shocked because he started to look at his, uh, you know, my file. Hey, I did this, I did this. You have to pay $25,000, maybe 99%. You are going to lose your right leg too. And he was watching me jumping in front of him. And I told him, Doctor, I'm not excited because I got healed. I'm excited because I got saved. I'm excited because if I got a heart attack in your office right now, my Jesus, my Lord is waiting for me. And that's the greatest joy of my life. So this is the same joy for you who are watching this right now. He, I'm not a special for God. God loves all the world. He gave His Son for all of you. The only thing that you have to do is put a little bit of faith. Trust on Him and accept Him who He is. He died for you on the cross. If you invite Him in your heart today, the Bible says all of your sin is going to be forgiven and your name is going to be written in the book of eternal life forever and nobody can grab it. Doesn't matter what happened to you, you will be the child of God. It's up to you. Uh, let me tell you, explain something to you today. Maybe right now you think that you're a Muslim and you are a good man. And I know you are. 
because you do sometimes good stuff that even I cannot do it. Maybe you do uh, help to people. Maybe you take care of the widows. Maybe you spend your money for those who are sick. Those all things are great. But the problem is, let back to the question that I had. None of them is going to give you any assurance what's going to happen after your life done. If we die tonight, we have to know where we're going to go. Have you ever think about that? If you didn't, I beg you, start to think about that tonight. Because this life is very short. But in Islamic faith, have you ever considered that there is assurance of salvation for you? If you find it, I love to know that. But I'm sure that there's no. But look at even what you do. Even I was in Mecca. You know how many sacrifices the people do during the month of Hajj over there? If you scratch your head, you have to sacrifice an animal. So do you think that God is waiting for the blood of animal to cleanse you? And by the way, have you ever asked from yourself why you do those sacrifices? Why you kill the animal? Because if you go back, somebody doesn't have an answer for you or they said, oh, you did something wrong, let's do sacrifice. But Christ is the only sacrifice for our sin. And the reason is he never had sin in his life because he was God. If he is God, which he is, he know how to take your sin out of you. Nobody else. If you look, st study the history of Islam, I never forgot that even the Prophet Muhammad, his daughter asked him, could you be an advocate for me? And he said, I cannot do it for myself. That's right, because man cannot do anything. But Christ is God. He left his glory in heaven and he came to the earth so that he can remove your sin. That's the reason you need salvation. It doesn't matter how much you are doing good stuff. You are here, God is here. And the gap is so deep. You try to jump out, maybe you are much better than me, you are here. But you fall out again. The only thing that happened, Christ passed this way so that he is lifting you up to heaven forever. We need salvation. You could say, I'm good, I'm fine. But don't be deceived. Because the only way to be the Father in heaven is through salvation of Jesus Christ. My father's family came from Egypt. My mother's family came from India. And I was brought up in London, England, in a Muslim family. Uh, we would go to the mosque. Uh, my father was very strict in his prayer life. And so that's the atmosphere and the environment that we were brought up in. Um, even though we were living in England, we were still holding on to our belief, holding on to our faith, and um, uh, we would uh, uh, pray, we would, um, uh, what they call Ramzan, we would fast, okay, we would go to the mosque, we would have the Quran, we would have the prayer mat, and that is the lifestyle that is what I was brought up in in London um, fully believing that that's the only way to live and that was the only religion that was the only belief that Allah is the only God and Mohammed is his prophet I had it in my heart to to become successful in business you know as a Muslim we're always trying to find ways to become successful uh, we're supposed to become successful I got involved in many businesses um, many of them failed but I didn't quit and finally I ended up with one company that um, became very successful I had attained a six-figure income I could drive a car that I wanted I could live where I wanted and you know, everything that I dreamed of happening, it happened. And instead of being excited, instead of being fulfilled, there was an emptiness inside. There was something missing inside and I didn't know what it was. And I started searching at different places to find out what was it. I thought that if I had financial success, I had everything. But obviously there was something else still missing. And then I uh, met this young lady and she had invited me to her parents' home uh, for dinner which was great and here I am sitting uh, after dinner talking to her 
a mother and in the middle of a sentence I actually fell asleep. Now if you want to <laughs> make a good impression that's not the way to do it and I didn't know what happened. I woke up on the couch, I had a little rash on the side of my neck. I thought, what is this? I, I left and I went to um, the local hospital and they said, look, it's not a problem. Just take these pills, uh, uh, Tylenols, and you, you wake up in the morning, you'll be fine. I went to bed in my home. I woke up in the middle of the night, wanted to go to the bathroom. And I walked into the bathroom. As I stood in the bathroom, like that, I passed out. I woke up on the floor. I realized there was something seriously wrong with me. So on all fours, I crawled back to bed. And I looked in the mirror, that little rash on the side of my neck had grown to blisters half an inch in size. I was in so much pain that I actually got a piece of paper and wrote my will. I thought that I was going to die that night. I didn't know what was going on. I called uh, um, this young lady to help me, who I just met, to, to drive over and take me to the hospital because I was in incredible pain. And uh, they diagnose it as the worst case of shingles. Now, what is shingles? It's a virus of the nerves burning the skin from the inside out. If your head was covered in uh, gasoline and someone put a match to it and there's nothing you could do to stop it, you know, that's the kind of pain that I was in. Uh, finally, they said, we're going to have to admit you. They gave me an injection to knock me out. The next morning, I woke up with a temperature of 107.6. Now 104 is critical, 108 is death. I was 0.4 away from death in this hospital and uh, when that occurs, it's called hypothermia. Oxygen doesn't get to the brain and the brain cooks itself. So here I am with a temperature of 107.6. Brain is cooking itself, the body is burning up. It feels like gasoline on the side of my head, burning up, there's nothing I can do to stop. It. And the next day I wake up, I have chicken pox. Shingles, blisters, temperature 107.6, brain damage, and then chicken pox at the same time. I mean, my body was starting to shut down. Uh, this young lady that I had met who brought me to the hospital sat there by the bedside. Um, she was the only one that sat there. No one else would come in without gloves and masks. And every day my condition was getting worse. Every day they were taking blood samples and my body was not fighting back. I remember one day, two doctors came in, and as they examined me, uh, one doctor said to the other, there's nothing we can do, he's going to die. The very people that I had my trust in, my hope in, had now given up on me and left me to die. Who do you turn to when the, one, the ones that you're counting on to make you better said there's nothing they can do? I remember that when this young lady came back, I told her to leave, to go away, to forget about me. Imagine she never met me. I did not want her to sit in the room and watch me die. Well, she didn't leave. But that night, they called her out. They didn't know uh, uh, even if I would be a vegetable or how I would survive. And they told her that. But then they said, really, what we're trying to tell you is that he probably won't make it through the night. That night, I opened my eyes, I cried out to God, and I said, God, if you're real, help me. I was afraid of death. I, 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 it, it just was a fear on the inside. I didn't know what was on the other side, but I was afraid of it. And I cried out, and I said, God, help me. I believed in Allah. I believed in Muhammad, and I cried out for them to help me. I was in pain, I was suffering, I was about to die, the doctors had given up on me, I was desperate and in desperation, what do you do? I cried out, help me Lord, help me, help me God. And I'm here to tell you that when I made that cry, something happened that night in the hospital room. I did not get a response from Mohammed. I did not get a response from Allah. But when I opened my eyes, there was a figure of a man at the end of the bed. And it was beams of light shining from this person. So I couldn't describe to you what this person looked like. But it was an outline of a man and light shining out. But I knew immediately that this was Jesus. Now, people ask me all the time, as a Muslim, 
how do you know about Jesus? Well, because the Quran talks about Jesus. Jesus was a man. He did walk the earth and he did heal and he was a prophet. So the, the Quran acknowledges that there was one called Jesus. What the Quran does not acknowledge was that he was the son of God. It acknowledges he was a man, he was a good man, he was a man that healed. So I knew instantly that this was Jesus. And this outline of a person said two things to me. And I couldn't tell you what his mouth said. All I know is this is what I heard. One, I am the God of the Christians. Number two, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all of a sudden, this person, this God, this being that was in my room was telling me, I'm the God of the Christians. I knew it was Jesus Christ. And then he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that meant a whole lot to me. Now, that's all that he said. Next thing I know, I'm awake, the doctors are examining me in the morning and they said, we don't know what's happened to you, it has gone into remission, instead of the blisters growing, they've stopped growing, they've started to recede, you are so well, you can go home now. They left me to die the night before, the same doctors are now saying, you can go home. I didn't know what to do, I was still in fear, I said, no, 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 I don't want to go home, my, that room was my security, so I said, please, please, let me stay one more day. They let me stay one more day. I remember it was Saturday. They released me from hospital. Uh, the blisters were still there, but they were, they were not growing anymore. And they said that when those blisters fall off, I would have white patches all over my face and my body. It would look like I was in a fire. They sent me home with a care trail lotion, sleeping pills, knockout drops, all kinds of medication because it was still very itchy there. But it said it wasn't growing anymore. But I had one burning question in my heart. This Jesus that would come for a dying Muslim, is he really the son of God the way those Christians claim? Or is he just a prophet or a good man? the way I was taught all of my life. The next morning, I woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Why did I wake up at 6? I have no idea. But I got out of bed. I walked over to the television in the living room and I turned on the television. And on the screen were these words, Is Jesus the Son of God? Coincidence? I don't think so. That was the burning question in my heart. And there were two men talking. They answered this one question, is Jesus the Son of God? And every question in my heart got answered. And the healing that had occurred in the hospital was an incredible miracle, but a greater miracle was about to happen. Alone in my living room, on my knees, in tears, they led me in a simple prayer to ask Jesus to come into my heart, to come into my life. I gave my life to Jesus. The next day I went out to buy a Bible because I wanted to know who is this Jesus. I really didn't know him. I read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and I read some things about this Jesus Christ that he was a good man, that he did good things, that he healed people, he took care of people. And I thought, whoa, this is wonderful what I'm learning about him. I never realized that this was a God of love. I never realized how much he loves people, not just Christians, but I mean Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and everybody. I never realized that he went and died on the cross. I didn't know any of those things. And I started to learn about what he did when he walked the earth and how he helped people and how he loved people and how he healed people. And I found a picture of the way I used to look before I got sick. And I said, Lord Jesus, I know that you healed people in the Bible. I know you did something for me, but can you make me look like this picture again? I remember that I woke up five days later. It was five o'clock in the morning. And the doctor said, don't scratch the blisters, they're contagious. And I must have scratched some of them because, because they were on the side of the pillow, there were some blisters. I got out of bed and for the first time I walked into the shower since I got out of hospital. I stood under that shower for one and a half hours praying to this Jesus, would you help me Jesus? And in that shower, I'm here to tell you every single blister one time fell from my head, from my face, from my ear, from my neck, from my chest, from my shoulder, from my back, fell totally. The skin was red like raw meat. And for the first time, I started to shake. 
and I said, Lord Jesus, can you make me look normal again? Well, as you can see from my face, there are no white blotches. My skin has been totally, completely healed. My eyesight is 20-20. My hearing is normal. My speech is okay. And there is no brain damage. The doctor said, you will always have this virus called shingles in your body. You'll have the slightest bit of stress and it will erupt in blisters again. Well, I'm here to tell you that I've had a whole lot more stress since then. Never have they come back. I have been totally, completely healed. Who is this Jesus that would help a dying Muslim? He went to the cross and he died because I know that I have sinned in my life. We have all sinned. There is no perfect person that is out there. Even the Muslims believe that if you ask them, are you going to heaven? They will say, inshallah. What does that mean? Well, uh, you know, I hope so. And you ask them, why is it? That's the way I was. I said, I hope I'm going to heaven because I didn't know. See, at the point of death, if your good works exceed your bad works, then you're going because it's all based on works. And if they don't, then you're not going. So it was always based on works because, you know, we know that no one is perfect and we cannot stand before a good God knowing that we have sinned. So our good works always had to exceed our bad works. Well, all of a sudden, reading the Bible, I find out that I, I, I have sinned, but this time God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross. Why? To pay the price for my sins so that I don't have to say anymore I hope I'm going to heaven. I might go to heaven. If everything is okay, I go to heaven. If my good works exceed my bad works, go to heaven. I've once of all, I realized that because Jesus went to the cross, he paid the price for my sins. And I now have assurance. I have guarantee. I know that I know that I know that because the price for my sins have been paid, I am going to heaven. I have that assurance that when I die from this life, I will have eternal life. And that's what got me excited that I can know for sure. And you know, the, the other thing that I learned when I was a Muslim was that there is one exception to the uh, uh, good works and the bad works and it was called jihad and jihad is when you would die for your cause and if you died for your cause then for Islam for the cause of Islam then you're guaranteed to go to heaven and then I looked at the Bible and I looked at the Quran and the Quran was talking about works that would allow me to go to heaven the Bible was saying that if I accept that Jesus paid the price on the cross I automatically got to heaven I looked at the Quran and the Quran said if, uh, if I get involved in jihad and if I die for my God, I'm going to heaven. I looked at the Bible and the Bible says, if my God dies for me, I'm going to heaven. I saw totally different things. I saw something that opened my eyes. I, I saw here that if I ever leave Islam, I'd be in trouble. It, it, you know, it, uh, that it was through fear that I had to stay in Islam. And, but over here, I saw a God of love. In the, in the Bible, that, that, that I could do whatever I wanted to do and he would love me unconditionally. I, I saw here hope, I saw here healing, I saw here abundant life, life more abundantly. And I looked at the two and I said, when I was left to die, it wasn't Mohammed who came, it wasn't Allah who came, it was Jesus. He healed me, delivered me, set me free, paid the price for my sins and gave me eternal life. And so I could not help but make the choice in my life. It was Jesus that came and healed me and delivered me in my desperation. I gave my life to Jesus. And since then, I have found out there's so much more in the Bible, so much more that God wants to do, so much more that Jesus paid the price for, not just for me to make it, but for me to have life abundantly. And so I studied the Bible more and more and more. I found out about something called grace, that He loves me. And because God loves me, He wants to take care of me. Because He loves me, He wants to heal me. Because He loves me, He wants to take care of my family. And when I saw these things in the Bible, it opened my eyes. And I realized there was another way. There was a better way. A way to live where I could love my children and I could see the best for them. And that my, my God also loves my children and wants to see the best for them. 
So I studied the Bible and I started to apply it into my life. Giving my life to Jesus was the first step. Now as I learned, as, as diligently as I was reading the Quran, I started to read the Bible. And I saw so many wonderful things in there. And I started to apply them in my life. And you know what? That's exactly what has happened. I can share with you, my friend, that my life has been transformed. I'm healthy today. I'm whole today. I can see today. I can walk today. I, 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 I can uh, 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 feed my family today. My children are healthy. My wife is healthy. We're living, living the life that we always wanted to live. And the best part is that not only do we get to enjoy life now, because of what Jesus did and because of what the Bible promises us. But we also have eternal life. We also are going to go to heaven. Only now I have an assurance that this Jesus has already paid the price. And so I say to those of you that are watching, those of you Muslims that are watching, just like me, I believed everything you believe. I was brought up in that home. I was brought up in that lifestyle. I, I thought that the other people, the Christians, the Jews, they were all bad. I, I, I fully believed that we were the only race, that we were to take Islam all over the world. That was the mandate in the Quran, that we should convert all the unbelievers. And that was what I wanted to do. But when I was sick, when I was desperate, when I needed help, it wasn't Mohammed, it wasn't Allah, it was Jesus that came. And I, I, I still don't understand why he could love me when I was not lovable, how he could love me when I, I spoke against the Christians. How could he love me? And I realize now that God loves everybody. He loves the Christians, he loves the Muslims, he loves the Hindus, he loves the Buddhists, he loves everybody because he created us and he loves us as his children. And just like we as natural parents want to see good things for our children, He wants to see good things for us, His children. God so loved the world. How much does He love you? So much so, if you were the only person on planet Earth, He would have sent Jesus to die on the cross, to pay the price for the sins that you and I have committed. Why? So that He can be united with you again. So that you can be united with Him again. So that we don't have to think maybe we're going to heaven. Perhaps we're going to heaven. If we have good works, we're going to heaven. We can have the guarantee. For sure, I know that I know. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with God. And you can know exactly that. I was born into a family of... Uh five brothers and four sisters. It was my duty to protect Islam, to fight for Islam. And I remember if any of the Christians would talk to me, I was the leader to protect Islam and to really prove to them wrong. And I remember that even in uh, the country I am in today, the first uh, time I met with the Christian, uh, we were in a kind of retreat. The Christian uh, a friend invited me to this retreat. Uh, I was uh, Muslim. And I remember the friends, you know, the young people with me were pushing me to be the leader to protect Islam because I knew, Engl uh, I knew English more than they did. And so tell them, tell them this is wrong. Protect Islam. And so it was my duty you know, and it, it would give me, as we say, clouds as a young lady to protect Islam. And this is the only thing I know. I didn't know anything else. That's why I was satisfied until I became uh, a young lady and started thinking to myself. Before I was doing exactly what my family wanted me to, then I came to the point of being a, a, a young lady. I started thinking. If uh, God is omnipotent everywhere, uh, if God is everywhere, why do we have to look to Mecca to pray for God? Otherwise, He wouldn't answer. If the Quran is the language from heaven, why can't I talk to God with the language, the Arabic language that God gave me? Why can't I talk to God? different than 
what we have to repeat every time we pray. I want to share my heart. I want to share my tears with God. Uh, my brother uh, became Christian. And it was my father's desire for me to go to this country where I am today because he wanted me to finish my education. When uh, I came to live with my brother and I met his friends who were meeting, studying the Bible, uh, having fun, relaxing, it's a lot of fun for them. And for me, I was like, we say the darkness. I didn't know that then, but I was trying to fight for Islam, which we have al jihad. I was trying to prove to these people that they are wrong. They're saying that Jesus is the Son of God. God forbid we'd have a son, because I was thinking in the Islamic mentality that if you tell me Jesus is the Son of God, that means God came down and married Mary and then become Jesus. And that is not Islam. And we do not accept that. I was trying to prove to these people that uh, the Injil is uh, corrupted. That's what I heard all my life. And they're telling me it is the word of God. What do you mean the word of God? He came and, and talked to you? But even though I was fighting with them, when I am alone, I was asking God. I started asking God, God, I see something I want from these people. But if these Christians are wrong, why do I feel that way? And if they are wrong, uh, right, God, why am I not like them? And I started doubting. The more fellowship with these people, the strong I am with asking questions to slap them in the face, telling them that Jesus is wrong. He is just a good prophet. Just what I learned as a Muslim. But I heard them saying, he is a savior. I heard them saying, he's a friend. I heard them saying, he is God. And to me, I remember the first time they uh, were saying that, it was burning within me. I want to fight them more because that's not right. That's not what Muhammad said. But then, from that point, I start thinking of Muhammad and Jesus. I start thinking of the Quran. When these people start talking to me about Christ, I ran to my book, the Quran. I start reading more, and the more I'm reading, I, I, I was shocked. The contradiction in it. I was struggling because as I see the truth in comparing the Quran and the Injil, this is a shock for me. The second shock was they're telling me I'm wrong and I'm not ready to be wrong yet and I don't want to be wrong. I want to prove to them that they're wrong. The struggle got stronger and stronger. I was torn inside and I even went to my people looking to stop that struggle in me. My soul that needs to be, you know, thirsty. But unfortunately, or fortunately, I want to say, they did not have any satisfaction or satisfied or any answer that would content the thirsty spirit that I had. I came back and I said, I'm looking. And so I began to, to pray, God, if you are the God of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad and the wives of Muhammad and the neighbors of Muhammad and all the people until I came and you are the father of El Messiah. Jesus, if you are the Son of God, Jesus, help me. I'm so tired within me. If you are God, let me see you. 
And after that, slept that night. And next day, I was thirsty, more thirsty, to hear about Christ. I felt at peace. And, uh, in this, and uh, the next morning, I felt more hungry. I began to ask more questions for anybody, for those Christians that I meet anywhere. And God started sending tracks in my life. You know, anywhere I go, we ha I had a track and I read it. It was God everywhere, following me everywhere I'm going. But this Christian said, you will, God loves you. And I said, who is God? And they said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. And I said, how do I get to God? And he said, no one got to God, to the Father, but through his Son. And that is the turning point in my life. Seeing the love, seeing the joy that these people have. After I became Christian, I thought to myself, should I just keep my faith secret? Or should I take a stand because I learned to take a stand for what I believe in? I took a stand and dedicated my life for uh, mission work. I dedicated my life for the work of Christ. To help my people learning, taking that joy. Because if you ask me how my life changed, oh, you gotta know me before. I was in political organizations, trying to fight for the people, trying to look better than others, uh, trying to be as loud as I can to get my rights. But Jesus came, number one, gave me the joy that I saw in the Christian. And the joy to me is to accept the situation even in the darkest moment in my life, there is hope. There is little light there that Jesus is with me. You want to know what my life changed? You better know me before. Maybe some Christian said, oh, this woman can never be Christian. But today, I am a servant of God. I would like to talk to my people, the Muslims. I know many of us, are going through the struggle that I'm going, I went through. Many of us are looking for the truth. Who is God? Many of us maybe are singles, feel lonely. Many of us have the money, the power, but have the emptiness. My friend, my friends, Jesus is the answer. And you want to have the peace that I'm talking about? You want to have the joy? Ask God to forgive you. You see, we are walking, we are, we are living in a way that is not pleasing to God. And to start a new life, you can come, kneel down on your knees and say, God, help me. Because we can never clean our uh, bad deeds by ourselves. We can never do that. But Jesus can. He died on the cross for you and me. He died for all the people to say, God, help me. Would you come? Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to lead you. Ask Him to show you the way. Kneel down. Pray. And ask Him to come and help you. And He will be the answer. grew up in a, in a Muslim environment and um, we didn't talk very much about God uh, because in my home God was far away and we had to be respectful of Him. However, we, we never really talked to God or it was not a personal God. We knew all of us that God had created us, there was a God and uh, if we did something wrong He would punish us and if we did something good, maybe or maybe not, He, he, he would reward us. One day I was um, I felt like I was unfairly punished by my mother. I didn't do 
anything wrong. And she, uh, she asked me to go to the corner of the room after I was punished. And I didn't know. I just wanted to climb all the walls and everything. And I felt it was so unfair. And suddenly I heard a voice who told me, Hey, Shireen, Shireen, it's okay. It's your mom. Just love her. Everything will be fine. And I, I, I started to hearing this voice. And I just... Uh, I felt peace, just peace came over me and I just forgot, forgot about all that punishment and everything. And I, so I personally, I was used to call that voice my God and my God was in the corner of the room. That was all I knew. Otherwise my, my mom and dad's God, they, it was far away and it, if he would do something wrong, uh, he would come and punish us. So this was how I, um, I grew up. There were a lot of things happening around us in our country and there was a revolution and everything and I was in the middle of it and uh, therefore for my own safety they uh, decided to send me to France to study and uh, to finish up the high school and to go to university there. Somehow, uh, miraculously, I ended up in a convent together with nuns and priests and I was the only one who was not, uh, you know, who did not know Christ. And, uh, you know, I was just observing those people who were serving me, who had not done anything. Uh, you know, I did not even pay them. I was living with them. They were preparing my meals like as if I was a princess. And they were talking to me. And, uh, you know, I really, um, that was the first time in my life, you know, after, uh, you know, my parents who had given me the unconditional love. These people were first people who had given me unconditional love and I could not understand that. And, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to know what, what was going on in their mind, in their heart and everything. And uh, that was how, how I got to hear about Jesus. Not that they evangelized me, but that I myself, on the back of the convent, there was some meetings and I asked to be in those meetings. And there they had Bible studies and they were talking about Jesus and so on. Now, I did not know, as I looked at my dictionary, Jesus uh, for us, it looked like I knew about him. He was a prophet. and. Uh, uh, at the end of the Bible study, they told me that Jesus was Son of God. And that did not really seem very um, intelligent to me. However, I looked at them and they were mostly pro pro professors at universities, very highly educated people in those Bible studies and everything. So that made me even think more about maybe, you know, maybe not everybody here is crazy. Maybe, maybe I should investigate more and to know more about Jesus. And, uh, you know, I um, put almost God to test and I, uh, I at, the, at the start, it was difficult for me to call God as Father, Jesus, Son of God and, and so on. It, nothing made sense to me, actually. But, you know, because of the unconditional love that I was receiving every single day, Although I was a naughty girl, I did lots of wrong things, and I did all the wrong things of the world, and still they were smiling and showing me grace, and they loved me. I said, wow, even if my mother had been there, I would have received some punishment, and they don't even want to punish me. I mean, I was fascinated with them. I thought, wow, this is, you know, uh, I just have to find out about this mystery. And the more I got to know about Jesus and whatever he did, I was fascinated with him, with this, his character, and I wanted to become like him. My uh, way of thinking was a little bit like Jesus. You know, he had come to save the world. I want to do the same. I, I wanted to go and save the world. And I called Jesus as my favorite man. He was not really my God, but he was mostly my favorite man. And so um, this was how I had it until... Um, series of events and miracles happened where I was directed to Norway, the north of Europe, and I ended up in a Lutheran church there, and I discovered more about Jesus there, and, uh, you know, at, and the unconditional love. For me, there, um, I converted to Christianity, however, you know, for me, it was just like changing religion. Still, I, I felt like I had not given my heart to Jesus. Um, uh, 
So because I always, my, my way of thinking was that I came from a society where they ignored women, where, where they disrespected women, where women were inferior. So by going and, uh, you know, just trying to become like Jesus and trying to do uh, like other Christians, I could become a better person. Um, until I uh, came to a point in my life where I was, uh, I had a lots of problems and I felt like there was no way out for me. As I was crying and I didn't know whom to cry to, you know, I had a cross in the corner of the room, I had the Bible, but it was there. And suddenly I fainted there and I had a very, very strong vision. And this was, um, in that vision, I saw a man coming from that, w that way and he was dressed like, uh, they show Jesus dressed on the cross. And everybody had, had raised their hands and I was in the third row. And uh, uh, everybody raised their hands and they wanted to touch him and he let himself be in touch. And suddenly I cried and I said, oh Father Jesus, please come and help me. And I, it, in, in that vision, it didn't seem like he heard me, but he came closer and closer. As, his, as he came closer, I just looked at his eyes. The only thing I wanted to know, if he was mad at me. You know, it, in a Muslim, uh, the Muslim way of thinking is that, you know, you, you are not really a sinner until you have really sinned and done something wrong. And so that was for me the first time standing in front of God and feeling like I was a sinner and I really did not deserve to be forgiven. That was how I stood in front of him in that vision. And I was just looking, just looking and seeking in his eyes if, if he, there was a, a way he could forgive me from what had happened. And I didn't know what had happened. However, can you forgive me in this situation? Is there any way out? And he, as he, he came closer, I looked at his eyes. He, I felt like his eyes had suffered so much. However, suddenly he opened up his arm and he asked me to go to him. And I could not believe, it was as if they had given me the whole world. I ran to him like crazy, I took around his neck and I said, you know, I don't care where you go, but wherever you go, I will be hanging from your neck. As I opened my eyes, I had the Bible right here and uh, uh, I was pretty scared when I opened my eyes actually and uh, I was just trembling and I didn't know what to do what, what, what actually happened I was just trying to explain to myself what happened and uh, and when I remembered the vision uh, and then I I said that to, to one of my Christian friends he said that well that was the first time you really repented and you know I think you got saved and the, the most amazing thing was that everything that I hated before I liked now and everything that, that I liked before, I hated now. You know, all the worldly music and so on did not make sense. And when even reading the Bible, uh, well, I had the Bible right next to me, so I, as I opened it, it was as if the words meant something else. It was something, some cover from my eyes that was taken away. I could see and I could understand the Word of God. And it, it was amazing, I cannot tell you. I, I felt like, like a new person. The other person died. I mean, what happened to the other person? I could not explain it. I am a new person who can enjoy and who can see all the opportunities and everything. I remember the God at the corner of the room, the, the, the voice that was already talking to me then, the voice that, that was giving me peace. And they said that, God, will you give peace, peace that is beyond our understanding. And uh, uh, so suddenly, you know, everything uh, fall, uh, in the right place, you know, just I felt like, wow, so he was that and he did this and uh, it, it, it felt like a plan that uh, he really wa wanted me to be saved. And uh, in spite of the situations, uh, you know, every, he used the, every difficult situation to uh, make himself known to me and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very privileged to know Jesus today. This is a person that you can talk to and uh, you really want to have the Spirit of God in your life to guide you because otherwise your life does not make sense at all. And you, you would want a God who empowers you. You would want a God who, who gives you wis wisdom 
you really would want that than a God who just sits there and observes you. Oh, you did this, so you're going to be punished. I'm not sure if you're going to, to, to heaven or you, you're going to go to, to the opposite side. Uh, you know, you would want a God who, who really give you unconditionally, abund abundantly his love. That's what you would want to have. I mean, it's not even to be compared with any religion or any type of faith. Understanding unconditional love was something uh, very important, something very important. And many times as I myself approached uh, a Muslim friend, it has been like, uh, I understood for them, it was like, oh, she wants to make us the member of her church. She wants us to do this. That's why she's doing that. So. Uh, I, I really didn't want it, this to be only an advertisement for something, that's something, be, you do this because of that, but just do this because your life is going to change. You're, you're going to see all the possibilities that you have, you're going to see the, uh, God's plan for your life, the purpose of God for your life, you're, you're going to enjoy your life. Even if you are in difficulties, you're going to have, uh, uh, you, you're going to see your possibilities. Even when, when, when the world around you thinks, that everything is lost you still see the light because you have hope you have the hope that that is and no, nobody can take that from you I come from a Muslim family and I'm from Turkmenistan Central Asia and I grew up in a large Muslim family a family of 11 and um, in my family I was I had a very close relationship with my mother and I was um, a seeker from a very young age and I was close to my mom because my mom was a religious person so one day I remember coming home from school I was fourth grade and I always wanted to understand God you know and all the things that God created sometimes it didn't make sense so I, I came home and I asked her I said is there really God does God exist and her response to me was, yes, there is God. And she was a very um, a devout religious Muslim. Her heart was always helping out our neighbors, helping people in the neighborhood. I watched that in her, and that's why I was just drawn to what she does. I trusted her, you know, my mother, so I would do whatever she would do. So this actually continued until I went to college. In college, you know, I lived with these two German girls. They asked me, they approached and asked me if I would move in with them. So I did. And I found out, after I moved in, I found out they were Christian girls. So I helped them with the language. And from time to time, they used to give me a, a little booklet, Christian little booklet to translate. So I translated the Christian booklets, Christian literature for them. And as I did that, I learned more about Christianity and I've never heard about Jesus before so they used to share the gospel with me saying you know salvation is through Jesus Christ and that's the only way to God through Jesus Christ so I was very confused at first because I thought I grew up believing a God you know now why are you telling me there is you know Jesus is God so it was very confusing but so I listened to them, but one thing that I noticed in the mornings, I've never ever done this in my life, they would get up early in the morning and have a cup of coffee and sit in the corner. At 6 o'clock in the morning they get up to have a quiet time. And that was very fascinating to me. They would wake up early in the morning, I would ask them, what are you doing? I want to spend time with God. That was one of my roommates' response to me. This is how I start my day. I have a, you know, I have that close relationship with God and I talk with him and then then I go to do my things around. So s things like that, they were such a great witness of God's love and they were very forgiving, very gracious and very loving and very understanding. So I just noticed that difference in them. And I kept asking myself that question, you know, I can't love myself <laughs> enough. But these girls are loving me so much. Where do they get that love? So one day I asked them, I said, you are so different. What makes you so different? And they're just one short, you know, reply to me was, it's the love of Christ in us that makes us so different. 
and she said, it's through because of his love I can love you. If I had to love you with my love, she said, I couldn't love you. I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to love you. It's through Jesus' love I love you. So that made, that made sense. And they were very forgiving. And I will never forget one time I was just a little bit, you know, offended by them. And my way of winning the situation was just go about not talking to them. So I didn't talk to them. I didn't want to talk to them. Then one day on my little table on my desk, I found this little card with a box of chocolate saying, will you please forgive me? And forgiveness was something that was very hard in my culture, in a Muslim culture in general. I couldn't forgive. I would go like for days without talking to even my own parents because I was offended. But these girls taught me the true meaning of forgiveness. And this was the first time that she I've ever seen somebody come to me and ask for forgiveness. I cried and cried and cried and that was another testimony of God's love. So this, with this life I continued and um, they would share the gospel and I would just, I would still, I was resistant because I really wanted to make sure that what they were sharing was the truth. I didn't want to go with just with what they said. So I kept searching and they also called him Jesus, a friend. And they said they could talk to him anytime they wanted. So these things and their character qualities, they really attracted me. I wanted to have that same love that they had and the character qualities that they had. I wanted to own them in my own life because I wanted to be able to love these people. I just couldn't do it because it was my own love. So I kept thinking about, okay, I can call him a friend. I can come to him and talk to him anytime. So these things kept my mind busy. So then this was still during my college. Then I went home for school break. I didn't say anything to my mother because I was afraid. I was afraid of the consequences. In my culture, it's if you are a, a Turkmen, that's what I am then your identity is you are a Muslim. That's how everybody sees. So I can't change my identity. If I did, it would bring a big shame to my family. And my mother, I don't know, she might reject me, so I was afraid. I didn't say a word. Then I left for college again. I couldn't sleep one night. I just couldn't. It was like until 4 a.m. in the morning, I was up. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. I, I heard this, um, it wasn't an audible voice, but just the voice inside me kept asking me all these different questions. So finally I sat up and leaned against the wall and I kept hearing these questions inside me, you know, why is it taking you so long? And it's been four and a half years almost that I've been witnessed by my missionary friends. And I knew that God knew my heart was full of fear of the, the consequences of my decision because I know I might be rejected. I know I might lose my job. I know I might be kicked out of college once they find out I'm a Christian because the government, they hate, you know, they don't like Christians. So I was, I was afraid of the consequences of my decision. So those fears. So one of the questions I felt like inside, God was asking me, you know, why do you fear men? fear God and at that point I knew that it was definitely Jesus talking to me I had no doubt that it was him talking to me and trying to get my attention and I knew that it, that was the time to ask him to come pray and ask him to come into my heart but I didn't know how to pray so a friend of mine had given me a little booklet for spiritual laws so that was the first time I pulled out that booklet from the bookshelf and I just, in my room, there was a light coming out from the street. I didn't want to turn the light on and wake up my roommate. So just by the light that was coming through the street, I just read that prayer in that booklet. And then just the moment, instantly, I just felt his peace and joy. I can't even describe that moment. It was such an extraordinary, amazing moment that the joy and peace that I've been longing for for since like in the in the beginning I mentioned I was a seeker from a very young age I was 12 I was very like religious person from a very young age 
So I've been longing for that peace, you know, because I always felt empty inside. And I was trying to feel that emptiness with going to a fortune teller or worshipping dead spirits. Or I tried to fill it with everything, but everything lasted just for a while. And they all had kept me going back, going back. You know, it would last a week, two weeks, or six months. Then I had to keep going back to what I was doing to feel that emptiness in me. But after that prayer, I prayed that prayer for the first time in a long time. I just felt whole. And it's, it's still, like I said, my words can't describe it. So then it was maybe 5 a.m. in the morning. After I prayed that prayer, I was able to go back to sleep. And I, the next day in the morning, I woke up and I'm going to work. I used to take a bus, you know, usually the bus is full of people and I used to get so easily angry. I could already notice the change in me. Like I'm friendly towards people and I'm not angry. And I look around, I look around and look at the trees and everything seemed alive and, and the same that I felt inside too, very like energy, just unusual energy and refreshed for the first time in a long, long time, you know, since I was a little girl. And um, after that, I knew that I didn't have to, I used to do sacrifices. My parents used to do, to sacrifice animals for my sins. So I knew that I didn't have to sacrifice anymore because Jesus is a perfect sacrifice once and for all. And for the first time, you know, I could, I just felt very different. I, I can't explain it. You know, I felt very different, free. You know, I felt like, okay, I received the, his gift of Jesus, gift of forgiveness and freedom from sins and freedom from obligations that I had to do. And all these places that I used, I had to go all the time. I was free all of a sudden from all these. And I can sense his peace, the supernatural peace that in me. And just from then on, you know, now I can't imagine my life without him. You know, not, not even a second. You know, when I think about Jesus, he has become, ever since that moment, he has become my all in all. That's what all I can say. He's, he is the source of my life. I can't imagine my life without Him. And I know that without a doubt in my mind, I know that I found the ultimate truth that I have been searching. And it is Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate truth. As a Muslim, we try to wash our sins away by sacrificing an animal or by, you know, like, during Qurban Bayram, a religious holiday, you try to wash your sins away by swinging in the swing. But these are all just, you know, temporary things. It doesn't completely wash away your sins. You always have, like every year, you have to keep going back to that place and doing that again, and then you think your sins are washed away. But Jesus, He died on the cross and shed His blood for us. And so it's the blood of Christ that washes your sins away and once and for all. So it's done once, then you never have to do it again. So it's just, He is the ultimate truth. And that's what His Word says. He is the one who gives life and He is the one who died. And it is a, it's the fact, it is the, the truth. And He sets us from you know, our sins and from whatever we are enslaved to. To me, it was worshipping dead spirits or going to a fortune teller, going to a witch doctor, going and worshipping these 360 dead prophets. But I've done all those things and I thought they helped me, but they didn't. They didn't. They did just for a while, but then I had to keep going back to it. I had to give, it wasn't a complete thing. It wasn't completed. With Jesus, it's completed. It's done and it's done.